Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this talk, uh, focusing on seismic reservoir characterization in the depth domain. Uh, what I'll do today is, is to take you through uh, the application of some new technology which has been developed by Icon Science over the last uh, several years. We'll start with a, a brief introduction and rationale. Um, so why would we want to uh, invert in depth uh, in the first place? Following that, we'll start to we'll, we'll recap on what some of the key challenges are before introducing uh, the facies-based inversion technique in the time domain and how that uh, technique has been modified to operate in the depth domain. Following that, uh, we'll take a look at a, a brief case study uh, before summarising with a handful of uh, conclusions. So historically, uh, the vast majority of seismic data have been uh, acquired and processed in the native um, time domain. But in the last uh, 10, 20 years or so, um, we have seen pretty dramatic improvements in depth processing and imaging, uh, and specifically uh, the true amplitude recovery that's required to make those data sets appropriate for uh, quantitative uh, reservoir characterization studies. Correspondingly, um, there have been pretty significant improvements in the velocity modeling aspects of uh, the, the, the depth imaging. Um, and as a result, what we have started to see is that uh, a significant number of, of uh, companies and interpreters in those companies um, are, are starting to undertake all of their seismic interpretation uh, uh, workflows um, exclusively in the depth domain. So that, of course, poses some challenges for us um, in the reservoir characterization community uh, in that uh, the vast majority of technologies out there uh, for reservoir characterization are exclusively time domain. So there is a growing desire across industry to work in the depth uh, domain. And of course, that brings uh, benefits in that it's a completely sort of consistent and common medium for communication across all of the geological, geophysical and engineering um, domains. There have been a number of um, industry solutions put forward and, and that are actively in use um, uh, across the world. So uh, looking back through some of the literature, um, there were papers by uh, Ishpal Singh, for example, that looked at uh, a, a technique that, that considered uh, depth-based convolution. Uh, that process essentially um, uh, imposes a, a constant velocity model assumption to stretch the, uh, the, the, the time data to a pseudo depth uh, that, that, that is um, uh, appropriate for a, a sort of convolution uh, model. Um, geostatistical inversion, so there are flavours of geostatistical inversion out there that um, do work in depth, but it doesn't come without some of its uh, challenges. And of course, full wave field uh, elastic inversion uh, delivers products back in depth, but there are various uh, limitations to the techniques uh, that we'll, 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 we'll um, dig into in a couple of slides time. So what we'll talk about in some more detail in this paper is the an adaptation of the facies based inversion scheme that was first introduced uh, or, or introduced and discussed in uh, the paper by Gunning and Sams in 2018 um, with the specific specific objective of, of trying to address some of the limitations of the existing industry solutions. So let's take a, a closer look at, at just a couple of the uh, solutions that are out there. So. Uh, Salsus and uh, Sams um, showed in their 2012 paper um, application of a, a dynamic depth conversion um, that was basically uh, built into uh, a pre-stack simultaneous geostatistical inversion framework. The basic idea here is that you define a velocity model uh, that correctly converts between uh, depth and time and that's calibrated to each of the wells. All of the simulation of uh, rock and elastic properties and all of the model misfit analysis uh, uh, is, is, 
performed entirely uh, in the depth domain. And the convolution and seismic misfit analysis is performed uh, in the two-way time domain. So we do the model update in depth. The model is then translated to time. Uh, synthetics are constructed. We look at the misfits and those misfits are then taken back into the depth domain uh, where the uh, model terms and, and, and the model itself are updated. Uh, and we iterate until uh, we, we, uh, we minimize the uh, object, objective uh, function. So excellent piece of technology, but it doesn't come without uh, some, some fairly significant um, challenges. Being a geostatistical inversion, it of course relies on a fairly good knowledge and representation of uh, data and geometry uh, and correlation um, in the subsurface. Typically, you need to define a fixed geometry uh, for the layers, um, which, which themselves uh, house uh, the different variograms and, and geostatistical uh, relationships. And one of the, the big issues there is that um, those boundaries become fixed. Uh, and so you don't allow for, um, you know, uh, faces, different combinations of certain faces transitions across those boundaries. And so the structural model itself, the structural stratigraphic model itself, uh, tends to impose um, uh, effects into the data. Um, and, and, and of course, those horizons themselves uh, were, were picked from and started life uh, from a seismic interpretation, which itself uh, would suffer from things like tuning, uh, wavelet and other data uh, phase issues. So essentially with a geostatistical inversion, there's an inherent struggle against some of these um, fairly rigid uh, uh, and you know sort of systematic uh, errors that are built into uh, the starting model. Full wave field inversion um, is is still very much an emerging uh, technology. It's seen tremendous progress uh, over the last uh, ten or so years. Um, there are some some excellent uh, papers out there, and uh, looking back to a, a paper that was published. 10 or so years ago um, by Aperto and Virio that provides a, a, a nice sort of overview of, of, of where uh, the industry was at that point. So FWI or full wave field uh, inversion um, is essentially a, a very challenging compute intensive uh, data fitting procedure um, that utilizes full wave field modeling um, to fit uh, in a, a fit synthetics in a quantitative manner uh, to seismograms. It's progressed enormously since um, that time, um, but there are still major issues, uh, compute costs being, being one of them. Um, and you can see the relationship defined there between uh, the frequency content of the uh, inverted properties uh, versus the compute cost. So there are significant increases in the compute cost uh, for each incremental increase uh, in, in the frequency that, that, or the target frequency that you, you, you want to achieve. Um, there's a lot of work uh, looking at full elastic um, wave field inversion. Um, it's estimated that, that you're looking at a, a, an increase in at least 100 times in terms of compute costs. Um, and, and of course, this is to try to uh, get amplitudes that are, are correct for those generated from the shear wave and density components. Um, and of course, even having achieved those two first uh, points or addressing those two first points, um, there are still no sort of sensible constraints which have been built into uh, FWI uh, to date. So how do we ensure that the properties that, uh, that, that come out actually uh, honor the rock property relationships that we would know uh, to be true for certain regions. So much work uh, to be done. So to sort of summarize uh, and, and, and reiterate on some of the challenges, inversion in the time domain, you know, two-way time is, is, is typically completely abstract to geologists and engineered, engineers. All of the models and geomodeling exercises and flow simulation the things that are ultimately used to 
uh, make make you know, significant monetary decisions on are all performed in depth. Separately, uh, but, but but very relevant to to us, um, conversion of discrete quantities from the time domain to the depth domain cannot be performed without uh, very strong uh, aliasing. So very uh, so invariously, what happens is you you take your facies and elastic property inversion that was done in in two way time, you try to translate it to depth. Um, and what happens is that all of the elastic properties close to any of the facies boundaries um, uh, uh, end up uh, being corrupted. In the depth domain, various people have, have proposed different solutions. Well, you know, convolution fundamentally can't be done uh, in the depth domain without imposing some pretty abstract and, and somewhat dubious uh, concepts. Um, we are also going to assume that the depth predictions from the processing are, are robust, but of course, you know, any any depth imaging uh, process will only be as good as the sort of starting models and and, and other data that were available uh, when when it was performed. As soon as new well information is is acquired and uh, the models are updated, you'll end up with a different depth uh, image. And geostatistical inversion was very good is also very data intensive. It's very time consuming. Um, it uses uh, concepts and methods which which we know are, are or have their, their limitations. Uh, and it, it also requires a significant degree of expertise. And FWI, um, very time consuming, very expensive, uh, and doesn't really achieve the sort of resolution that uh, that we're, we're yet uh, looking for. So what we uh, propose is, is a solution that, that tries to address some of these shortcomings and, and, and really sort of, you know, sits somewhere in the middle of all of these, these solutions. So the FACES based inversion that we're um, using um, jointly solves for FACES and elastic properties, um, given a set of, 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 of uh, starting uh, inputs. So it's a Bayesian simultaneous inversion um, that, uh, that is essentially solving the equation to the top left of this slide. So what we have is the posterior distribution of impedance and facies given the seismic. And that's proportional to the likelihood function, which is the seismic given the impedance. Uh, in this case, this is the forward model. The impedance given the facies, and of course we can be within any of the predefined uh, FACES categories that have been defined by the user. So it's an absolute uh, inversion. It delivers FACES estimates and absolute elastic properties, but everything is done in the time domain. In terms of how the actual algorithm operates, we start by defining uh, two uh, FACES uh, or, or any number of different FACES categories but within each facies category, we would have a corresponding impedance trend. So that's a, a trend versus two way time. Uh, and a set of corresponding model relationships that, that allow us to estimate at any particular uh, point in two way time, uh, the P wave, S wave and density values of each facies plus their uncertainties. In order to actually kick the inversion off, um, of course, we've said it's a, an absolute inversion, so that implies there has to be some sort of uh, absolute starting model, and uh, indeed there is. And the way that we construct that starting model is to take a proportion weighted average of the input trends. And we refer to this as our sort of soft uh, faces model, uh, uh, which is used to construct what we call the uh, starting prior or, or sort of hybrid uh, prior model. So if we assumed a very simplistic binary geological setting and we assume uh, that, that the net growth in that setting is on average 50%, we would start the inversion off with a model which is a weighted combination 50-50 of sand and shale. And that will give us uh, a, a starting PDF that goes into the very first uh, step in the inversion, which is a linearized Bayesian inversion where we're minimizing the misfit uh, 
uh, between the seismic trace and the synthetic trace. So that gives us a starting set of elastic properties. Once we have those elastic properties, they're fed back into what we call the E step, which is referred to as the expectation step. And this is where we perform a facies classification of each of the elastic properties that came out of the first M step, the maximization step. The facies that come out of, of this E step are then used to create a new weighted version of the input trends. So at this point, we have a new starting uh, model which is based on a facies estimate, which came from the first elastic property inversion. This model is then fed back in to the M step, where we again perform this minimization of the, uh, elastic, uh, the synthetic and the seismic. The elastic properties are updated and they're fed back into the E step and we iterate until convergence. And convergence is the point that the facies image is not changing beyond a certain degree of uh, variability from one iteration to the next. What then gets output is the most likely elastic properties uh, and the most likely uh, facies. Okay, so these two things are fundamentally constrained and tied to one another. If I come out as a, as a sand facies, I will have elastic properties that fit within uh, the rock physics uh, model characteristics for that particular face is, and likewise for shale. So very quickly to run through that in pictures, because it's often easier to sort of uh, visualize these things um, uh, in a piecewise manner. I start with two wells. I have sand and shale distribution in each. I combine the logs in those wells and then perform a compaction trend analysis uh, of those. Those compaction trends can be linear, they can be exponential, uh, they can be of any functional form uh, that you wish. In this case, um, we have a pair of trends for sand and shale with corresponding uncertainties. And of course, these, when combined with their rock physics model, define elastic property PDFs in AI VPVS space, but equally in VPVS and row space. What we do next is we, we construct our hybrid prior model. So we take our proportion weighted average. So in this case, I'm just going to say, let's assume it's 50% net to gross. Okay, so my starting model is 50-50 shale and sand. That 50-50 uh, ratio is used to construct a new uh, PDF. And of course, because it's 50-50, the mean impedance sits slap bag in the middle of the sandstone and the shale trends and the uncertainties of course uh, basically envelope the entire uh, distribution so i have one pdf and it covers the entire distribution uh, or range and elastic properties for both sand and shale so it's a very broad um, uh, uh, pdf next um, we want to uh, set up the inversion so what's going to happen is I've got my target trace location, I've got my PDFs, I define the hybrid prior, and what happens now, we put the hybrid prior into the inversion, and it has to now find uh, perturbations to that red uh, solid line that when convolved with a, a synthetic, uh, with a wavelet, uh, minimizes the difference between the target trace and the synthetic. It's very loosely constrained, so it can put all sorts of different variations uh, in the elastic property contrasts. And effectively, what comes out at the end of that is a impedance trace, which is shown in black for iteration one. And of course, the corresponding set of elastic properties uh, that sit um, anywhere in and around the red PDF, which of course exceeds uh, the limits of, of, the, of the rock types that we're really interested in. So it's a very loosely constrained, linearized Bayesian inversion. The next step, as I mentioned before, is that we go to the E step. So now what we do, we remove the hybrid prior PDF, and what we're left with are the two original 
PDFs for the correct rock types that we're interested in. We can now look at each of the individual elastic property uh, points or samples that have come out from the inversion. And depending on where they sit relative to those true rock property PDFs, we can assign them a classification and we can assign them a probability. So now some of those points get called a sand, some of those points get called a shale, and we can now construct a facies model at that trace location, which has corresponding probabilities. And we can also construct a new impedance profile, which forms the basis of the next impedance inversion and expectation uh, and classification step. This process iterates, trying always to maximize the probability of any of the faces or each and all of the faces um, at that trace location. And in doing so, what happens is it will find a configuration uh, that, that basically minimizes those misfits, maximizes the probabilities and draws in the loosely constrained elastic properties into the clusters that they most likely belong to. Doing all of this in time um, is, 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 is great, very well, um, but it does come with some limitations. One of the key limitations, it turns out, is that um, the sampling uh, of the seismic data itself um, imposes some, some challenges in terms of lateral continuity uh, and, and constraints. And that can ultimately limit um, or, or reduce the overall benefit of having lateral constraints um, in the inversion. So what was done as part of the depth domain uh, inversion was to come up with a method that would allow us to define the model space in depth at either very fine uh, and regular sampling or at fine or coarse and irregular sampling. So we could actually have a starting model which has irregular depth steps. For example, the type of model that you might get from a geocellular uh, grid. The finely sampled uh, depth model is then translated to time using uh, something called uh, Lagrange four-point extrapolation. So it's a mathematical method for uh, fitting data to uh, a model. And this is done in a completely uh, lossless manner. So we, we absolutely can reproduce the, uh, the uh, reflection coefficients um, without any aliasing uh, whatsoever. The reflection coefficients are then used to do the convolution in time and all of the model updates are done in depth at whatever target sample rate, regular or irregular, that you would like. So now when we revisit uh, the uh, schematic that looks at the way the uh, inversion works, well now effectively almost everything remains the same, but it's just done in the depth domain. The only part that happens in the time domain is the seismic to synthetic misfit. So we come up with our trends, which are all now in depth. We come up with the hybrid prior, which is all in depth. We then take our seismic, which is also in depth, and that is then converted on the fly to two-way time, where we do the seismic to synthetic misfit. The impedances are updated in depth, and that then is used to do the faces classification, which is also done in depth. So now the entire model update is happening in depth and the convolution is happening in time uh, where it should be in an alias free uh, manner. So we can now get all of the benefits of operating in the depth domain, which should help to give us uh, improved lateral continuity, better imaging, particularly where we have thin layers uh, and shallow dips or, or, or steep dips um, uh, and, and ultimately properties that, that are delivered directly from the inversion process in the domain that's relevant to the geologists and the engineers. So let's have a look at a, a, a short uh, case study. So the data set that we'll be using 
uh, is the Fortis field. It's a Paleocene turbidite reservoir uh, discovered in 1970. Uh, it's been on production for well in excess of uh, 40 or so years now. Um, and it's about four and a half to five billion barrels of oil uh, initially in place. It's a four-way dip closure with a stratigraphic element to the southwest of the field. It is stratigraphically comp complex, it's compartmentalized, um, and in fact the southwestern portion of the field, referred to as the Charlie area, uh, is, is actually in pressure uh, isolation from the rest of the field. Uh, the geology is characterized by uh, turbidite uh, channels and sheets, um, but of course the margins uh, of the field and the margins of some of these uh, the, the channel and sheets and lobes um, are difficult to image, but, but may contain significant volume. Um, <clears throat> one of the other challenges, of course, is that because of the um, frequency content bandwidth of the data, you know, historical methods have, have, have sometimes struggled to identify uh, these thin uh, areas of remaining pay um, or bypassed pay. So the seismic data set comprises uh, five angle stacks ranging from nine to 42 degrees. Um, the velocity model that we're using is a, uh, a layer cake um, velocity model, uh, varying uh, interval velocity um, across the area uh, based on um, 31 of the exploration and appraisal wells. Uh, we have a, a, a wavelet uh, that that uh, has been estimated for each corresponding angle stack. And we are using four uh, compaction trends uh, for four primary elastic facies being overburden shale, reservoir shale, uh, brine bearing and hydrocarbon bearing sand. Uh, looking at the velocity model itself, these were mapped out based on time depth pairs at each well location. The depth surfaces were subsequently tied uh, to the well tops and the velocity model uh, updated accordingly. Um, and as you can see from the images on the top uh, top right, uh, you can see that in the overburden there is a, a, uh, a change um, in the velocities. So uh, slightly uh, <clears throat> uh, higher velocities as we go off the uh, edge of the structure. So that will of course cause some um, distortion um, when you look at the data in the time versus the depth domain. Um, and looking at the target interval, you can see that there's an overall decrease in the interval velocity uh, from east uh, to west, uh, which is likely re related to changes in the net gross uh, through that um, interval. Now, we're deliberately using a very simplistic velocity model uh, because we want the guarantee of uh, calibration of the inversion in depth. And of course, if you have a velocity model from your uh, geo modelers, um, then that's the model that you would want to use so that you can guarantee the properties that come out uh, will be in the right place uh, for the depth model uh, and for the uh, petrophysical modeling that might be done for the uh, engineering model. The rock physics priors uh, were built up using um, some cluster analysis using Gaussian mixture uh, modeling as well as. Um, uh, Bayesian classification uh, as a sort of independent control and QC. Multi-well fluid sub was performed for all of the 40s um, reservoirs. And then the rock physics prize were defined as, as trends uh, of the form uh, shown uh, to the, the lower left of the slide. Um, now you can actually do this in the time domain um, inversion um, so we can provide depth domain trends uh, to the uh, inversion engine and it will convert these on the fly to the time domain. But for the depth inversion, of course, they don't require any domain conversion at all. Those trends define elastic property PDFs in every elastic property space. Uh, and for QC, we typically look at uh, P wave and density, VPVS, uh, AI VPVS and AI and shear to make sure that the uh, PDFs, their spread, the standard deviations are all um, appropriate for the data that we're, uh, we're actually looking at.
So let's have a look at uh, some results. So here we're looking at an arbitrary line through the echo area. We're looking at the near stack size being shown in depth um, and the same data uh, shown in depth, but that started out um, in, in a time. So that these are basically identical um, images. This area of the field was uh, only on production for six months at, at the time of seismic acquisition. So it's, it's pretty close to being at virgin uh, conditions, but there is some local production. What we're now showing is the inverted facies in depth. So both of these images are in depth, but the lower one is the, in, is, is the uh, time domain inversion converted to depth. And a close comparison of the two, uh, we can start to see some of these differences, uh, which can be problematic to us um, in the modeling space uh, and in the sort of volumetrics and reserves um, space. So we can see that there are lots of stair stepping artifacts. So this is the aliasing that we were referring to. And of course, any of the elastic properties in those regions uh, would be fairly dubious uh, in nature. Looking over at the um, southern flank uh, of the field, which is, is over to the left of, of each of these images, uh, we can see that, that moving away from the leftmost well, we get a very uh, clean and distinct imaging of a thin hydrocarbon column down to the flank of the structure. The corresponding time domain inversion, we see a lot of distortion. We see thick and thinning. Um, of, of, of that column um, as the samples drift uh, across uh, the various two-way time uh, samples. So artifacts that, that we really um, can't do much about uh, and, and that we do need to address. So we see better lateral continuity. We see better prediction and more realistic predictions of the hydrocarbons um, away from the wells. Um, and, and ultimately uh, uh, an improvement from uh, the depth uh, uh, based inversion. And because the elastic properties are tied to the facies images, we see a corresponding um, improvement in the elastic properties. So this is the VPVS. Uh, we see a good calibration to the wells, which are showing the equivalent uh, VPVS um, profiles. And we can start to see um, uh, evidence of, of thin layers, which are, are, are better resolved uh, in the depth inversion. Similarly, uh, we see the same types of effects in the acoustic impedance. And you will see, if you look in detail, uh, some, some improvements in the vertical resolution uh, between the two um, inversions. The real um, uh, benefit of this, of course, is in, you know, what do these things look like spatially? How do things connect up? How do they relate to the wells that have been drilled and the production profiles that have been realized um, over the uh, production period? So here we've got a comparison of the net pay thickness uh, across this uh, region of the field uh, with the depth inversion on the left and the two-way time inversion on the right. And I think you'll agree that there are significant differences between the two. So let's have a look uh, at some of those areas. So in the green area, we can see a considerable Im improvement in the lateral connectivity uh, across uh, the, the, the geobody that's been identified uh, in the west southwestern portion of the structure. This now appears to be uh, entirely connected uh, across that region. In the red zone, we can see a much improved um, image and we can now see potential connectivity of the column along uh, what appear to be some thin isolated or semi-isolated channel um, bodies. And in blue, all across the structure, particularly where we have uh, thin uh, hydrocarbon columns, we get better continuity, we get, get better connectivity, and in fact, we get a better correlation to the true position of the oil water contact uh, as is known uh, based on, on, on the production and the reservoir model uh, data. 
So a second arbitrary line uh, looking at the Charlie um, area. So this is the, the portion of the field to the southwest. So again, same images, uh, data in depth. Um, again, same um, comparison of the faces inversion. So we've got the depth uh, inversion sitting at the top. We've got the time inversion sitting at the bottom. And we see all of the same sorts of artifacts uh, coming through. At each of the locations uh, pointed out here, um, you know, in terms of calibration to the wells, the calibration is, is, is largely uh, uh, the same, but there's significant difference uh, in the detail uh, and the way that sands connect and the uh, imaging and the quality of the tops and bases of, of some of those picks. So we get a, a better uh, and perhaps more geological looking image. Again, we see all of those, those benefits in detection and resolution being pulled through um, into the elastic property images. So, for example, the intra-reservoir uh, shale that's imaged uh, in the uh, middle um, ellipse, um, but also some of the detail in the positioning of the hydrocarbon response uh, in, the, in the leftmost um, well. And of course, we see those in both uh, sets of elastic properties. Again, looking at the net pay thickness <clears throat> in regions of the field where you have uh, significant areas of sort of low relief, that's where these techniques will make a very significant difference to the reservoir characterization process. So again, the conversion of uh, the comparison of the depth and time inversions, and we can focus onto some uh, areas of significance. So inside the red polygon, we know that we've had significant production in this portion of the field. The time domain inversion, whilst it does show a patchy response, it's not immediately obvious that these are uh, completely connected or related to uh, the production wells that, that are shown. Uh, the depth domain inversion, because we have that improved uh, continuity and because we can do a better job of imaging thinner uh, zones of pay, uh, we get a slightly more plausible uh, relationship between the two. We've got significantly improved lateral continuity, particularly in this orange zone, where we have quite a thick channel axis coming through, um, which looks rather patchy in the time domain inversion, um, but, but shows much better um, uh, imaging uh, from the depth domain uh, inversion. And you would be right to question this, you know, how, how robust are the thickness predictions that are coming from the inversion? We're getting down to, you know, several meters, not, not, not tens of meters, but, you know, five to 10 meters uh, thickness. Uh, and I think you would be right to question uh, wh whether or not those are robust. Well, when we actually go and look at the well data in detail, and we look at the thin pay that was predicted at, at the well uh, to the south here, 21109, uh, we do actually get a good correlation between uh, these thin, certainly sub-seismic uh, depth predictions relative to some hard data uh, that, 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 that we have at that location. So validation of the inversion is, is of course, crucial. And lastly, we can validate that uh, those inversion predictions across the entire area. So here we have um, the uh, predictions of net pay thickness versus the true net pay thickness. And we can compare our predictions from the depth converted time inversion versus the depth native inversion. Uh, the two graphs on the right hand side, the depth inversion pay predictions are on the top and the time or depth converted time inversion predictions at the bottom. And we can certainly see an overall uh, improvement in the thickness predictions when we run operate the entire inversion algorithm uh, in the depth domain. So to summarize, um, what we've, we've presented is a pragmatic approach to inversion of seismic in the depth domain. Uh, the convolution of the reflectivities with the appropriate wavelet is performed in time where it should be, whilst all of the other aspects of the inversion are performed in depth. So that's things like the models, the model definitions, the updates, the prior proportions, the compaction trends, uh, 
and so on and so forth. And of course, now all of the uh, continuity constraints and succession constraints which are built into the algorithm are working in, in the domain where it makes the most sense. We can apply uh, velocity constraints uh, during the inversion. So not only can we use that velocity model uh, to position things in depth, we can actually use it as a, an additional constraint to ensure that the facies um, uh, predictions that come out through those intervals honor the underlying uh, velocity model so that we don't end up with uh, a facies and elastic property model, which is uh, at a bust with uh, the velocity model. We can choose and invert the data at a fine depth sam sample increment. Uh, we can do it at regular or irregular uh, sampling uh, increments. So that makes it, it suitable for sort of direct integration into reservoir modeling um, workflows. And as shown by the results on the data set um, in this particular uh, case study, uh, we do see the expected or anticipated improvement in lateral continuity. And we do see an overall improvement uh, in the predictions of pay thickness, uh, particularly uh, in the thinner uh, uh, pay uh, situations, which are of course of, of uh, utmost importance in these types of uh, field uh, settings. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and I hope you enjoyed the presentation.